The following sermon was recommended by our good friend Bruce Dugan. The sermon is titled The Joybringer and was preached by Alexander McLaren. Alexander McLaren was a Baptist minister in England who lived from 1826 through 1910, and he preached for 12 years in the town of Southampton and then 45 more years in Manchester. The key text for this message is Isaiah 61.3, which says, To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. In the little synagogue of Nazareth, Jesus began his ministry by laying his hand upon this great prophecy and saying, It is mine. I have fulfilled it. The prophet Isaiah had been painting the ideal messianic deliverer with special reference to the return from the Babylonian captivity. That was the liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound about which he was thinking. But no external deliverance of that sort could meet the needs nor satisfy the aspiration of a soul that knows itself and its circumstances. Isaiah, or the man who goes by his name, spoke greater things than he knew. I'm not going to enter upon questions of interpretation, but I may say that no conception of Jewish prophecy can hold its ground which is not framed in the light of that great saying in the synagogue of Nazareth. So then, we have here the man of sorrows, as this very prophet calls him in another place, presenting himself as the transformer of sorrow and the bringer of joy in regard to infinitely deeper griefs than those which sprang in the heart of the nation because of the historical captivity. There's another beautiful thing in our text, which comes out more distinctly if we follow the revised version, which reads, to give unto them a garland for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. There, we have two contrasted pictures suggested, one of a mourner with gray ashes strewed upon his disheveled locks and his spirit clothed in gloom like a black robe. And to him, there comes one who, with gentle hand, smooths the ashes out of his hair, trains a garland round his brow, anoints his head with oil, and stripping off the trappings of woe, cast about him a bright robe fit for a guest at a festival. That is the miracle that Jesus Christ can do for every one, and is ready to do for us if we'll let him. Let us look at this wonderful transformation and at the way by which it is affected. The first point I would make is this. Jesus Christ is the joy bringer to men because he is the redeemer of men. Remember that in the original application of my text to the deliverance from captivity, this gift of joy and change of sorrow into gladness was no independent and second bestowment, but was simply the issue of the one that preceded it. That is, the gift of liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that were bound were the cause of the gift of joy and the changing of sorrow into gladness. The gladness was a gladness that welled up in the heart of the captive set free, and a result of coming out of the gloom of the Babylonian dungeon into the sunshine of God's favor, with their faces set toward Zion with songs of everlasting joy upon their heads. Now, you only have to keep firm hold of this connection between these two thoughts to come to the crown and center point of this great prophecy as far as it applies to us. The center point is that it is Christ as the emancipator, Christ as the deliverer, Christ as he who brings us out of the prison of bondage of the tyranny of sin, who is the great joy giver. For there is no real, deep, fundamental and impregnable gladness possible to a man until his relations to God have been rectified. 
And until, with these rectified relations, with the consciousness of forgiveness and the divine love nestling warm at his heart, he has turned himself away from his dread and his sin and has recognized in his Father God the gladness of his joy. Of course, there are many of us who feel that life is sufficiently comfortable and moderately happy, or at least quite tolerable, without any kind of reference to God at all. And in this day of growing materialism and growing consequent indifference to the deepest needs of the spirit and the claims of religion, more and more men are finding, or fancying that they find, that they can rub along somehow and have a fair share of gladness and satisfaction without any need for a redeeming gospel and a forgiving Christ. But about all that kind of surface joy, the old words are true. Even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful. And hosts of us are satisfied with joys which Jesus has no part in bringing, simply because our truest self has never once awakened. When it does, and perhaps it will do so with some of you, like the sleeping giant that is fabled to lie beneath the volcano whose sunny slopes are smiling with, fl- with flowers, then you will find out that no one can bring real joy who does not take away guilt and sin. Jesus Christ is the joy bringer because Jesus Christ is the emancipator. And true gladness is the gladness that springs from the conscious possession of liberty. Liberty from the captivity which holds men as slaves to evil and to their worst selves. Brethren, let us not fancy that these surface joys are joys adequate to a human spirit. They are ignoble. They are infinitely foolish because a touch of an awakened conscience A stirring of one's deeper self can scatter them all to pieces. So then, that is my first thought. Now, let us suggest a second, that Jesus Christ transforms sorrow because he transforms the mourner. In my text, all that this joy bringer and transmuter of grief into its opposite All that he is represented as doing is on the man who feels the sorrow. And although, as I have said, the text in its original position is simply a deduction from the previous great prophecy, which did point to a change of circumstances, and although Jesus does bring the joy of salvation by a great change of a man's relations, yet, in regard to the ordinary sorrows of life, He affects these not so much by an operation upon our circumstances as by an operation upon ourselves. And he transforms sorrow and brings gladness because he transforms the man who endures it. The landscape remains the same. The difference is in the color of the glass through which we look at it. Instead of having it presented through some black and smoked medium, we see it through what the painter calls a Claude Lorraine glass, tinged golden, and which throws its own lovely light upon all that it shows us. It is possible that for the eye that looks, being purged and cleansed so as to see more clearly, that the facts remaining identical, their whole aspect and bearing may nevertheless be altered. And that which was felt, and rightly felt, to be painful and provocative of sadness and gloom may change its character and beget a solemn joy. It would be but a small thing to transform the conditions. It is a far better and higher to transform us. We all need, and some of us, I have no doubt, do especially need, to remember that the Lord who brings this sudden transformation for us does so by his operation within us. And therefore, to that operation, we should willingly yield ourselves. How does he do this? One answer to that question is, by giving to the man with ashes on his head and gloom wrapped about a spirit, sources of joy if he will use them, that are altogether independent of external circumstances. 
though the fig tree shall not blossom, and there be no fruit in the vine, yet will I rejoice in the Lord. And every Christian man, especially when days are dark and clouds are gathering, has it open to him and is bound to use the possibility to turn away his mind from the external occasions of sadness and fix it on the changeless reason for deep and unchanging joy. The sweet presence, the strong love, the sustaining hand, the infinite wisdom of his Father God. Brethren, the paradox of the Christian life is as sorrowful yet always rejoicing. Christ calls for no hypocritical insensibility to the ills that flesh is heir to. He has sanctioned by his example the tears that flow when death hurts loving hearts. He commanded the women of Jerusalem to weep for themselves and for their children. He means that we should feel the full bitterness and pain of sorrows which will not be medicinal unless they are bitter and will not be curative unless they cut deep. But he also means that while thus we suffer as men, in the depths of our own hearts, we should at the same time be turning away from the sufferings and their cause and fixing our hearts, quiet even then, amidst the distractions, upon God himself. He, we can turn our hearts upon him, but it is hard to do. And because we do not do it, the promise that he will turn the sorrow into joy often seems to be a vain word for us. It is not ours to rejoice as the world does, nor is it ours to sorrow as those who have no hope or as those who have no God with them. But the two opposite emotions may, to a large extent, be harmonized and coexistent in the Christian heart. And... Since they can be, they should be. The Christian in sorrow should be as an island set in some stormy sea with wild waves breaking against its black, rocky coast and the wind howling around it. But in the center of it, there is a deep and shady dell that heareth not the loud winds when they call and where not a leaf is moved by the tempest. In a like depth of calm and central tranquility, it is possible for us to live even while the storm hurdles its loudest on the outermost coasts of our being, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, because the joy bringer has opened for us sources of gladness independent of externals. And then there is another way by which, for us, if we will use our privileges, the sorrows of life may be transmuted, because we, contemplating them, have come to a changed understanding of their meaning. That is, after all, the secret charm to be commended to us at all times, but to be commended to us most when our hearts are heavy and the days are dark around us. We shall never understand life if we class its diverse events simply under two opposite categories, categories of good versus evil, prosperity versus adversity, gains versus losses, fulfilled expectations versus disappointed hopes. Instead, we must put them all together under one class, discipline and education, means for growth, means for Christ-likeness. When we have found out what it takes a long while for us to learn, that the lancet and the bandage are for the same purpose, and that the opposite weathers conspire to the same end, that of the harvest, then the sting is out of the sorrow. The poison is wiped off the arrow. We can have, if not a solemn joy, at least a patient acquiescence in the diversities of operation when we learn that the same hand is working in all for the same end and that all that contributes to that end is good. Here, we may suggest a third way by which our transformation wrought upon ourselves transforms the aspect of our sorrows. And that third way is that possessing independent sources of joy 
and having come to learn the educational aspects of all adversity, we hereby are brought by Jesus Christ himself to the position of submission. And that is the most potent talisman to transform mourning into praise. An accepted grief is a conquered grief. A conquered grief will very soon be a comforted grief. And a comforted grief is a joy. By all these means, Jesus Christ, here and now, is transmuting the lead and iron of our griefs into a gold of a not ignoble nor transient gladness. And may I say one last word. My text suggests not only these two points to which I've already referred, that is, first, that Jesus Christ is the joy bringer because he is the emancipator, and second, that he transforms sorrow by transforming the mourner, but lastly, that Jesus gives joy after sorrow. Nevertheless, afterward is a great word of glowing encouragement for all sad hearts. Fools and children, says the old Proverbs, should not see half-done work. At least, they should not judge it. When the plowshare goes deep into the brown, frosty ground, the work is only begun. The earth may seem to be scarped and hurt, and if one might say to bleed, but in six months' time, you can scarce see the soil for waving corn. Yes, and sorrow, as some of us could witness, is the forecast of purest joy. I have no doubt that there are men and women here who could say, I never knew the power of God and the blessedness of Christ as a Savior until I was in deep affliction. And when everything else went dark, then in his light, I saw light. Do not some of you know the experience? And might we not all know it? And why shouldn't we all know it? Jesus Christ, even here and now, gives these blessed results of our sorrows if they are taken to the right place and born in the right fashion. For it is they that mourn in Zion that he thus blesses. There are some of us, I fear, whose only resource in trouble is to fling ourselves into some work or some dissipation. There are people who try to work away their griefs, as well as people who try to feverishly drink them away. And there are some of us whose only resource for deliverance from our sorrows is that after the wound has bled all it can, it stops bleeding. And the grief simply dies by lapse of time and for want of fuel. An affliction wasted is the worst of all waste. But if we carry our grief into the sanctuary, then, here and now, it will change its aspect and become a solemn joy. I say nothing about the ultimate result, where every sorrow rightly born shall be represented in the future life by some stage in grace or glory, where every tear shall be crystallized, if I might say so, into a flashing diamond which flings off the reflection of the divine light, where there shall be no sorrow, nor sighing, nor any more pain, for the former things are passed away. When the lesson has been learned, God burns the rod. But, brethren, there is another, sadder transformation. I have been speaking about the transformation of sorrow into joy, but there is also the transformation of joy into sorrow. I spoke a little while ago about the laughter in which the heart is sorrowful. And the writer from whom I quoted the words goes on to say, the end of that mirth is heaviness. Thereof cometh in the end despondency and madness. I once saw on a hilltop a black circle among the grass and heather. There had been a bonfire there on coronation night, and it had all died down. And that was the end. A hideous ring of scorched barrenness amidst the deep green. Take care that your gladnesses do not die down like that, but that they are pure, and being pure are undying. 
Union with Jesus Christ makes sorrow light and secures that it shall merge at last into joy unspeakable and full of joy. I believe that separation from Christ makes joy shallow. It makes it certain that at last, instead of a garland, shall be ashes on the head, and that instead of a festal robe, the spirit shall be wrapped in a garment of heaviness. (laughs) 